Such was the multitude of corpses brought to the churches every day and almost every hour that there was not enough consecrated ground to give them burial, especially since they wanted to bury each person in the family grave, according to the old custom. Although the cemeteries were full, they were forced to dig huge trenches where they buried the bodies by hundreds. Here they stowed them away, like bales in the hold of a ship, and covered them with a little earth until the whole trench was full. Hello, and welcome to the Baba Yaga Project. My name is Devin. And I'm Sonia. And this week, we're talking about the plague. Specifically, the Black Death. Not the plague we're in the middle of right now. Although, this is real topical. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be drawing some parallels. Woo! Context! Historians love context. Um... Okay, so this is going to be a Sonya heavy episode, obviously, because I do not know anything about medieval Europe. So, so that's why we can start it out with like a crash course on the Middle Ages. <laughs> I would love a crash course. Take it away, Sonya. Hey, so the very spooky quote at the beginning of this podcast is from the Decameron, which was written in the 14th century. But we're going to start at the very beginning of the Middle Ages here. So it's a very good place to start. Exactly. So we're going to start out with a few important facts that are just, you know, very relevant for this whole time period. So number one, 80 to 90% of the population at This point is living in a rural setting. They are mostly doing subsistence farming. So I will be talking about cities to an extent, but just keeping in mind that a huge portion of the population is not actually living in a city. Uh, The other big thing to remember is life expectancy was driven down by child and infant mortality. So people who survived childhood could go on to live into their 60s, their 70s, their 80s. This this is important because we often get this skewed idea that like, oh, the life expectancy was 35, which means, you know, once once you were 15 years old, you were a middle-aged man <laughs> in their eyes. Like, no, it's <laughs> the life expectancy at 35 is so low because so many children basically died before their fifth birthday. But if you survived all those childhood illnesses and were able to build up that type of immunity and, you know, manage to live through all of that, then you, you'd you have a relatively long lifespan. Uh, the other big thing to remember is the age of first marriage was typically the early to mid-20s for most people. There's this idea that, you know, everyone in the Middle Ages is getting married when they're, like, 12, which just is not the case. If you were, you know, a peasant or an artisan, you had to be able to be sufficient in your trade and have a place to live before you could really get married. Um, If you were a woman, you would probably save up some money or some other assets by working as a maid in a wealthier person's house or by doing work around your own family home. So most people were getting married in the early to mid 20s once they were both able to support themselves and take care of a household on their own. This this Mm -hmm. This was true well through the Renaissance as well. Uh, outside of certain parts of Italy where women were, like, higher class women were being married as children. Yes, Um, absolutely. Because also, like, uh, people were reaching, you know, like, sexual maturity much later because they weren't as 
they weren't getting as many vitamins and like protein and stuff as people are now. Exactly. So onset of puberty tended to be a little bit later yeah. than what it would be today. And the the other big thing is wealthy people did tend to like technically marry younger, but even then, like for the most part, you know, you might get married as a 12 year old to like cement an alliance, but the understanding was that you weren't actually going to like consummate that marriage until you were, you know, maybe more like 16 or 17. So I I just betrothal process. Yes, exactly. So I just, this, this all becomes relevant once I'm explaining generational gaps (laughs) here. Um, I I just want to be very clear that generations are still going at about, you know, roughly every 25 years. It's not like 12 year olds are giving birth. Like, there, there are references to 12 year olds getting married and f- becoming pregnant in the Middle Ages, but it is typically, you know, it, it's written about as this like horrible tragedy that such a thing would happen. Like it wasn't a normalized thing. It was like, oh wow, that is tragically young. Yeah. For this person to have gone through all that. All right. We need to talk about the spoiled meat. So, for a long time, there's been this ridiculous myth that people in the Middle Ages and, like, the early modern world, the Renaissance, etc., all were eating spoiled meat because they weren't preserving it properly and that that's why they all wanted spices from India (laughs) so, so badly. It's because they were going to use the spices to cover up the taste of spoiled meat which is absolutely Food ridiculous be because if you could afford right number 1 food poisoning still existed <laughs> uh number 2 uh, if you are wealthy enough to afford spices in like the 1300s <laughs> you're wealthy enough to afford fresh meat like the spices are coming from halfway around the world the pig is coming from like next door in the barn (laughs) this is not like it's ridiculous but you know it's it's coming from this long um misconception of people would be reading medieval cookbooks and a lot of the time there's references to green meat which in the medieval context just meant unpreserved or fresh meat right because a lot of the meat you'd be eating in the Middle Ages was salted or smoked or cured in other ways to preserve it from going bad. But when people in the 19th and early 20th centuries were reading these, a lot of people came to this conclusion that, oh, they must have been eating spoiled meat. So again, this is going to become very relevant soon, but I just really need to drive home that nobody was eating spoiled meat. They were not doing that on yeah, purpose. Yeah, eventually we'll do a whole episode about why the Victorians suck. Uh, but Victorian <laughs> historians, Victorian historians in particular sucked because they really perpetuated this myth that people in the past were not very bright, if not absolutely stupid. So just put that out of your mind. People were pretty much as smart as people are now, which is not super smart, but, you know, they were smart enough not to eat stuff with fungus growing all over it or whatever. Bacteria. They they were also smart enough to take preventative measures during a pandemic. Hey. Oh! <laughs> sick burn! <laughs> oh, the world's on fire, Devin. <laughs> it's fine. Let's talk about the Roman Empire. Uh, yeah, so getting back to the Middle Ages, um, just for some more context, Sonia, because I think that, um, if you're anything like me and have, like, a deep, loving and passionate relationship with high fantasy, uh, you may realize that things that are depicted as the Middle Ages were not in the Middle Ages. You have no idea what the Middle Ages actually were. Everything is confusing. Your topics in history course was very confusing because it 
turns out that the Renaissance Fair is actually mostly 18th century stuff. Like, just so that everybody knows exactly what the Middle Ages are and the context in which we're coming to the Middle Ages, you want to give us a rundown of what what time period and maybe a little bit before to give us some context for this time period actually looked like how it happened. Absolutely. So we really got to start with the Roman Empire. It starts in 31 BC when Augustus Caesar declares himself emperor, and then it fell in 476 AD, partially because of like Germanic tribes invading them and also due to internal struggles, but it doesn't That doesn't really matter for us. The point is, you have an enormous empire that essentially just kind of collapsed in on itself and left an enormous power vacuum throughout Europe. Oh, this is getting really topical. (laughs) So trade got undermined. Travel became more dangerous um, because there was no longer, you know, really anybody enforcing any laws. And you end up with a bunch of smaller groups that are warring for land and for power. And this brings us to the Middle Ages. The early Middle Ages are from approximately 500 AD to 1000 AD. This is, think, uh, you know, the early rise of kingdoms. You know, the Roman Empire's collapsed. Life is becoming more localized, less interconnected. People start looking towards these local strongman leaders, also known as warlords, but because they're European, they're just called lords. <laughs> hey. <laughs> In exchange for this protection, these people would work the land and were compelled to give up a portion of their crops to the lord. And usually these farming communities were small, kind of isolated. Basically everything that you would use or have access to within your lifetime was probably going to come from, you know, your own village or the next village over kind of deal. Right. However, you know, over time, these kingdoms start to solidify um, and they start to have somewhat more stable and but also more complex hierarchies once you start you know taking in different lines of succession and all this kind of stuff so you're often getting territories being in flux ruling houses being in flux this is also the time when you're seeing viking raids this is when you're seeing the merovingian empire you're seeing the expansion of certain anglo-saxon kingdoms and just sort of slowly seeing some of these political kingdoms start to develop. Another big process at this time was the Christianization of Europe. In 313 AD, Christianity was made the official religion of the Roman Empire, but it was mostly still kind of central in Italy. But during the early Middle Ages, between 500 to 1,000, you're getting Christian missionaries, typically out of Rome and other places in Italy, setting out to convert the Germanic, Scandinavian, and Slavic people, who were mostly polytheistic at this time. Most of these missionaries would target kings, chiefs, and military leaders, because if they could get him to convert, then his people would typically follow. And for a lot of the ruling class, this was a pretty sweet deal, because at this stage, even kings and queens were often illiterate. So if you chose to convert to Christianity, you suddenly got access to this literate clergy and the system that comes with that, which if you're trying to set up a kingdom, having people who know how to read and write on your side and who can communicate over long distances via letter is pretty important. That's just, that's a massive technological advance. Being able yeah, to absolutely. Write. And we should mention again that like we talked about Christianization in, I think, like our first episode. Yes. Um, and the sort of layered way that that happens and the like syncretic nature of early christianity yes that this isn't just like suddenly now they're all puritans (laughs) no it's it's (laughs) definitely a like 
well, our military leader converted to this religion. Um, so, you know, I guess we're doing this now also? Sure. Yeah, like, it can't hurt to have Jesus on our side. The other thing is that when you had the church come into your area, there was typically, they would also bring along, like, resources for educating others and for creating these kind of learned communities, centers of education in monasteries and cathedral schools. So, you know, you're also providing these services to people. So it, it really takes hold that way. But another big part of it is Christianization also was a big part of the reason that widespread slavery was kind of came to an end in Europe. Because during the Roman Empire, slavery was, you know, completely sanctioned and it was fine. And most of the, you know, Germanic and Slavic and Scandinavian people kept slaves and sold slaves as well. Yeah, we should also clarify that this is not, like, American chattel slavery. It's yeah, not, no, no, it's no, no, not no. good. <laughs> it's still slavery, no. but also not I, I, American yes. chattel slavery. Footnote, American chattel slavery took all the worst parts of a lot of different types of slavery and put it all together to make it the worst possible situation. <laughs> this was, slavery. like, yeah, like, the worst possible outcome. <laughs> But but yeah, I mean, being being a slave even in the Roman Empire or the early Middle Ages still really, really sucked. Yeah. Uh, but then the church rolls into town and says, hey, you're, you know, your king just converted to Christianity and uh, Christians can't keep other Christians as slaves. So that gives you a big incentive to be like, yes, I am definitely 100% a Christian. Yeah. Um Free me immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it didn't work out quite that way, but you do see this big shift that from the year 500 to the year 1000, when you hit the year 1000, Europe is predominantly Christianized and has predominantly switched over from slavery as a key form of labor to kind of a variety of peasants and serfs which is kind of similar to being a slave but not quite because you still have like some rights yeah you're like tied to the land rather than to a particular person but the person owns the land it's yeah it's still like not great but you know it's a significant step up from like you are an item that i can buy and sell (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And also the church is rolling into town with all of these new technologies, you know, like writing and reading and arithmetic, I guess. Yeah, no, genuinely, they... (laughs) But that would provide a lot of power to this institution and to whoever joined up with said institution. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, monastic communities were particularly very popular because, hey, they're these big stone, typically buildings that are kind of in the middle of nowhere and away from everyone and you know you get room and board as long as you like pray so if you're living in a collapsing society with like marauding bandits and an unstable food supply that's not a bad deal like (laughs) And I mean, obviously, yeah, take note, people <laughs> of the current United States in a few years might want to join a monastery. I mean, I also do want to interject here and say that, you know, a lot of people also <laughs> were genu- I'm, you know, there were also people who were genuinely deeply devout. But, you know, also, <laughs> there were people who were like, well, I at least get fed and clothed and housed here so maybe not the worst plan and if you're like you know the wealthy ladies you don't have to get married off yeah if you join a nunnery party nun it up exactly (laughs) we'll we'll have a talk about party nuns another time (laughs) footnote party nuns (laughs) 
<laughs> put a flag on that one. <laughs> we'll return to it. <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay, so then, and so now we have a Christianized Europe. Uh, we have these multiple kingdoms. Um, what are we looking at as we go into the the High Middle Ages? Right, so the High Middle Ages is what you think of when you think of, like, medieval times TM. Like, this is <laughs> when you get proper, like, castles with towers and knights in shining armor and fair maidens in flowing gowns and, like, chivalric romance and, you know, that sort of situation, right? Like, that's when when most people think, you know medieval times that's what you're thinking of but i mean but also in reality this was a time of pretty significant cultural output uh the population doubles between 1000 and 1300 this is in part due to excellent climate conditions at that time they had pretty mild winters but also warm and relatively dry summers. So it's perfect temperature for growing wheat. You know, these kingdoms have begun to stabilize a bit. You have a more stable situation. Life expectancy goes up. Fertility goes up. People have more food to eat. Things are going pretty well. This is what allows for all the building of these castles, massive cathedrals, you know, bridges, roads, you're really starting to get more infrastructure back in, urbanization starts to happen. This is really made possible by not only the climate itself, but also the way that people are using their environment. Um, there's still farming in sort of an open field system where all of your peasants are basically working the land together, you have common land, common pasture areas where you can work together, you typically would still have access to forests to collect firewood, you could graze pigs in the woods, and you could grow your vegetables and keep a garden by your cottage. And there's also just the improvements in farming technology, where they figure out that if you grow nitrogen-fixing plants like peas or beans, and then the next year grow wheat on it because the wheat will deplete the nitrogen that you can kind of cycle through this so that you're always getting the best wheat output and this good output of like peas or beans to sort of add to the diet. Right. So I will add another footnote that uh, none of this sounds tragic. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like the commons isn't tragic. Keep this yeah. in mind. It's almost like people worked together to figure out that, hey, we can all share one oxen for the entire village, and then we can work together and have a bigger, heavier plow with that ox so that we can plow the fields better, and then we can figure out how to rotate these crops so that we maximize our food output, even though there's no private land ownership in that situation but you know it's whatever what up <laughs> maybe we can all work together and everybody eats better as opposed to one person having everything and eating everything and everyone else being sad and having to work at amazon so yeah that's the high middle ages it's mostly a party they do some really dumb stuff like go on crusades but you know, if you're just like a regular person who's a peasant living on a farm, you're doing pretty all right for yourself. It it's not half bad. I have a question a clear point of clarification. Yes. <laughs> um so I get how this is all working for the peasants, but right there is a hierarchy in middle age life. How exactly is that working with like the lords and the kings? Right. So if you are the king of your kingdom, you technically own all the land, hypothetically, but this means that you essentially need to 
have a way to get all the people who are kind of underneath you to stay in line. So, like, you want all of your dukes and barons and other fighting men uh, to be loyal to you. So you say, okay, I'm the sovereign of this nation, and I'm going to give Lord so-and-so, you have, you can have this parcel of land to use. And then Lord so-and-so has his knights, and he says, well, you can have these portions of my land. And then the knights typically have, you know, peasants working their land, and lords also have peasants on their land that they're using for their own estate, basically. Typically, you know, you're, like, imagine it as that feudal pyramid that they show you in, like, elementary school. And that's, like, not a bad representation of the general structure, with the king kind of owns everything at the top, and he's got his lords underneath him who have their knights, and then the peasants are kind of at the very bottom. But there is, you know, some nuance that isn't captured in there. Like, you'd have peasants who would be working directly on a lord's land, right? Um, And also you could have peasants who are called yeomen who actually were able to, you know, scrape together some extra money and buy their own plots of land. Uh, People who are living in the cities don't really fall into this because within a city you have kind of your own social hierarchies of, like, the Lord Mayors and such of the cities and the city council and typically the like craftsmen guilds would hold power in the cities. And then of course you also have the church, which has its own hierarchy. So you have a lot of these like hierarchies that are coexisting amongst each other. Yeah. And I think that the pyramid also doesn't really capture the web of interdependency. Right, because it's, we're not talking about like Louis the Sun King kind of like divine right total. Oh, absolutely total. not. There is, you don't. The king, like the lords, are responsible to the king, but the king is also responsible to the lords and to the knights and to the peasants and to, like, so on and so forth. It's, it's a exactly the web. biggest sort of guiding guiding principle in the Middle Ages and even into a lot of the early modern period is this idea of mutual obligation of I am the king, which means I owe, you know, protection and wise ruling and good lawmaking to my citizens and to, well, not my citizens, but to my people. And, you know, again, as a peasant, you are owed protection from brigands and random murderers but you also owe labor to your landlord and yeah 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 and the other big thing is that in this pyramid it's often not capturing what what the situation of women was because women had kind of a more your status often ended up being tied into a male relative, so whether that's your husband's status or your father's status, or in the case of being a widow, that could be, you know, the status that your deceased husband had. You could kind of... There was a bit more fluidity of where a woman would fall in these categories, basically. Cool. And so as we get into the 14th century... Uh, What happens to our our awesome medieval party? By around 1300, the party is is winding down, but 1315, it just hits a screeching halt. Oof. So let's talk about the 14th century crisis. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) So it's the summer of 1315. It's cold. It's rainy. And your wheat just doesn't ripen. The crops are all failed. And then you have another crop failure the next summer. And another in 1317. So this was a really, really bad time of desperate starvation. People were eating all of their reserved grain. They were eating the grain that they normally would have kept for seed. um, Killing animals that you know, like draft animals that you would normally use for plowing just to have something to eat. 
a lot of people got to the point of eating just roots, bark, grass, foraged plants. This is where we get the source material for stories like Hansel and Gretel, where parents would abandon children in the woods because there was no food to be had and they could not feed them. There's even some reports of cannibalism, but that's, you know, uncertain of how true that was. Sweet. (laughs) Yeah. So we're in this this place of desperate desperate famine and this is across europe yes that's what made it so devastating is that it's not like you could even trade with a neighbor or with with anyone because this is essentially all of europe is just getting these summers where it's a constant torrential downpour like just it's cold and it's wet and it just rains and rains and rains and for wheat to be able to grow, it needs warmth and sunshine and just wasn't getting that. And when that's a big majority of your diet, you're getting really desperate because the wheat's not growing. A lot of other foods are also not going to grow under those conditions. And so into that comes our plague? Actually, first we get a cattle plague. <laughs> oh, whoa, there's stages, stages to this plague. There, there really truly is, because 1317, you know, it, it kind of eases off, you start getting a little more sun again, but then from 1319 to 1320, there was a cattle plague, which killed 62% of all bovine animals. So all cows, bulls, oxen. Wow, that's good. So yeah. now we have no wheat and we have no cows. So that's including like milking cows. Yes. And are um, like goats and sheep and stuff part of this? I don't know much about f- livestock. No, goats and sheep were unaffected. And okay. we actually don't know what exactly caused this plague. This plague. <laughs> yeah. um, they, there's, they just call it a moraine which is sort of a generic term for, like, illness. Um, But, you know, it could have been anthrax, it could have been hoof and mouth disease, it's very unclear. But this results in a really big loss, because as you said, right, you're losing milking cows, which means you're losing dairy products, which provided a lot of the protein in the average person's diet at that time. You're losing manure, which you would use to fertilize the fields. And you have lost the oxen that you can use to plow your fields. And remember, it's wet and it's heavy and the land is really like muddy and gross. So you want these big, strong animals that can really pull these heavy plows through the field and most of them are dead now. So essentially you have a drop in the population from the famine, which means there's fewer people to drain the land again, and you have the loss of oxen, which means it's hard to till the soil at all, and they've eaten most of their reserve grain during the famine, so you're just in this horrible feedback cycle where you've lost so much so quickly that you're really, really struggling to recover. Wow. That's awful. And so when you talk about the the drained land, is that because it had been raining so much that they needed to drain land? Or had they reclaimed wetlands and then these wetlands were flooded again? Essentially, kind of both. There were some people who were um, living on these, you know, what had been reclaimed wetlands. Um, and that they had been draining either with simple ditches or with actual, like, drains that they had built to siphon off excess water. Yeah, you also had people who were just living in places that had a more low-lying area or places with more kind of absorbent soil. So, you know, you're you're getting this very uncharacteristic rain, like just crazy amounts of rain that isn't fully re-evaporating 
year after year and you're in this situation where, yeah, in some cases, people, as you were saying with drained wetlands, you lost so many people that they couldn't maintain the drainage in those wetlands. And then, you know, in places that prior to all this extra rain had been, you know, perfectly fine arable land are suddenly in this position where they have to make choices about, like, are we able to drain enough of this water to make it usable again, essentially. Wow, that sounds miserable. Yeah, it took until about 1325 for grain levels to, like, reach anywhere near normal. And, I mean, restocking cattle just took forever because, you know, a cow can have, like, one calf at a time. So this yeah. is, again, it's a long, slow recovery process. Yeah. And, I mean, you need things to feed large livestock. Which... Yeah, exactly. And you can't make hay when there's no or little sunshine. So that's harder for you to acquire food for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there is, um, there's also the fact that the people who were in charge of these parts of land, so the aristocracy, the gentry, the lords, etc., their response was essentially, in many cases, a focus on increasing their herds of sheep, um, because then they could sell wool as a cash crop and then buy food, which which creates more problems for your peasantry, because sheep don't produce anywhere near as much meat as a cow they don't produce anywhere near as much milk and obviously they're pretty useless for plowing purposes yeah so it's like a temporary stopgap you're not investing in future food yeah exactly there isn't this long-term investment and there was also there's also not really much in the way of evidence of even things like growing more beans or peas to try to make up that protein gap. So there's hypotheses that it took about 12 years before people were eating normal amounts of protein again. Oof. So now we come back to, you know, my whole spiel at the beginning about you can't eat spoiled meat. Well, yeah, they couldn't eat all their (laughs) diseased cows. Uh, And also, we're going to just remember real quick about like life expectancy and marriage ages, because, you know, if you're someone who was around for, you know, the initial famine and then for the cattle plague, guess what? You're still alive in 1348 and that your entire generation is a group of people who've undergone famine and then a chronic protein deficiency and the kids you were raising and having would have also undergone protein deficiency and general lack of food. And it's 1348 and the Black Death rolls into town. Woo, so everyone's really set up for success. Yes, everyone is That's just what I'm hearing. Prime, prime physical performance here. And it sounds like in this period of, you know, just ultimate good times that the sort of like governing systems that these people are living in are also in like prime peak condition for dealing with something. Oh yeah. They definitely are super duper prepared for a pandemic and definitely know how to take care of their population during this time. And no one is panicking. Excellent. Just kidding. (laughs) That would never happen okay. ever. So we're finally here. We've made it to the Black Death. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Plague. At long last. So let's get on to this. Like even uh, we've just been getting increasingly topical. Like we have this horrifying right. climate crisis. <laughs> you know the ways that that climate crisis <laughs> is affecting food production. Going into uh, general government decline to massive plague so most topical issue up front black death uh for anyone who does not know the specifics why don't we go over what exactly the black death is all right so the black death 
Can I just say, what a good name for a disease. A plus naming. I... We need we need a better name for Rona. Is I, all I'm yes, saying. it needs to sound less <laughs> friendly. Yeah, I just I wish I I mean I don't want to call it COVID nineteen anymore. I want to call it like that's that's my call to action for this episode. Is everyone sound off? What's what's a better name? Everyone wear a mask. Um, okay, so the Black Death. You're saying <laughs> right? Let's we're going we're back in 1348. It's fine. Everything is not fine. All right, so the Black Death is caused by Yersinia pestis. It's a bacteria that is spread by fleas. These fleas mostly live on rats. So, you know, most medieval cities, not great about pest control, which, I mean, in fairness, modern day cities, also not great uh, in terms of how many rats are around. So, you know, you if, if you were going to come in contact with... These rats and the fleas that are on the rats, you were going to get the Black Death. And basically the symptoms included, but are not limited to, fever, aching joints, the formations of buboes, aka swollen lymph nodes, which would turn black, hence the name Black Death. People who caught the plague had about an 80 to 90% chance of dying within eight days, depending on the strain. However, if you were unlucky enough to get septicemic plague, which is the least common of the three forms, that had a mortality rate of 100%. Your symptoms would be high fevers and purple skin, and often it would progress so rapidly that there would be no time for these enlarged lymph nodes, aka buboes, to even form. So this is a truly terrifying disease because of how rapidly you catch the disease, how rapidly it progresses, and how quickly you can die from it. When I say that you have an 80 to 90% chance of dying within eight days, that doesn't mean that everyone even took the full eight days, right? Like, lots of people would catch it and be dead the next day or the day after. So it's this very traumatic situation, and especially within the medieval worldview, where they didn't view a quick death as a good thing. Right. Because you didn't have time to, like, atone, or why was a quick death not good? I mean, yeah, it's essentially that. It's that you didn't have time to, you know, atone for your sins, get your last rites. Um, and and typically there was also want this sort of wanting to, you know, say your goodbyes to loved ones, make your preparations, sort of being ready for death and at peace with it. And whereas dying, you know, so quickly is, you know, again, it's a shock. And it's also this very painful thing when your norms surrounding death are much more communally oriented. And I'm assuming that as this disease ravages Europe, the availability of priests, even for the people who did take a full eight days to pass on was extremely limited. Absolutely. And there's, I mean, that's what the quote from the Decameron at the beginning was describing. It's how people, you know, normally you would have had these very ritualized funeral processions. You would have had, you know, the proper last rites. You would have had blessings over the grave and these sort of very, um, yeah, this this sort of ritualized exit from the mortal plane, if you will. Whereas during the Black Death, you know, you have these plague pits, essentially, where they're just sort of at a stage where they're burying people en masse, which is, you know, completely anathema to the normal treatment of the dead in the medieval world. Like, even the poorest of the poor in medieval times, were afforded, you know, proper burial. Like, it was a big deal. You didn't just dump a body in a hole. But that's essentially what they end up doing, because there just isn't an option. And even when you can find, you know, even even if you have a priest there who's able to do some form of a funeral, it's still kind of, you know, 
cool, you're performing a funeral for, like, this entire pit full of bodies. Yeah. So this is, I mean, clearly this is just, like, a massive existential crisis for an entire continent. Yeah, essentially. I mean, it's, you're having this horrible situation where, A, it's a disease that you've never dealt with before. You don't understand how it works or where it came from or how to deal with it, and it's also upending all of your normal social uh, ways of ways of living and your ways of being around other people in your community and your way of making sense of the world. That sounds familiar. Uh, but just uh, before we like really dive into you know what comes of this existential and cultural crisis, how, as this disease like shows up and starts spreading through Europe, how did people understand the illness? I mean, we've all in the entire world now gone through this process of learning about a new disease, but we have the benefit of, you know, modern sciences and being able to literally see the virus in a world where that's not possible. How did Europe understand this illness? Right. So, so in medieval Europe, the understanding of health versus sickness was understood in this very holistic way, where it's sort of merging their religious paradigms with natural causes, right? There isn't this divide between, like, what's scientific and what's you know, superstitious or religious, because it's all existing within this sphere of, like, the natural. Right. Because the this, this, this source of the natural and the source of everything is religious. Y- yeah, exactly. So you have this idea that, you know, there is the Christian God who created the world, and it's a very neatly ordered world. The medieval understanding of the world is very it it lines up very neat and tidy and everything has its place so you have your four humors which correspond to the four elements which correspond to the four seasons and you have to keep your four humors in balance in order to maintain your health But those humors can be affected by seasonality. So, you know, in the summer, you can have too much, too much heat. In the winter, you can be too cold and wet, right? Right. And um, there's also these ideas that different plants, different animals, different minerals can correspond as well to these humoral processes. So a lot of medical advice at the time is pretty at least in the lead up to the Black Death, is what we would consider probably just like wellness advice. I I mean, we have this idea that the Middle Ages is like, ah, yes, let's, you know, put a hundred leeches on you and then hit you with a stick so that we can get the demons out of your body. But the reality of it is really mostly about maintaining a healthy regimen, as they would call it, which meant eating a moderate amount of food, getting enough sleep at night. Typically, you know, you could be prescribed bathing in a certain temperature of water. So it was usually if you had too much heat, you would take a cool bath, or if you were too cold, you would take a warm bath kind of deal. Yeah. So it's very, very much this idea of keeping everything balanced. But this becomes a problem when we come to the Black Death, because suddenly all of these things that had normally worked aren't working. And yes, you had doctors and other, you know, learned people such as priests or other tradespeople who maybe had some medical knowledge doing things like bloodletting to try to release the bad humors, trying to, you know, bathe the um, the buboes, you know, as the pus comes out to try to move along that process, you have, you know, I th- almost today what we would think of as sort of hospice care, right? Where you have people, yeah. you know, trying to keep you comfortable in your last days. But there's, 
at this point, people do start to get very panicked because it's not, you know, the paradigm through which they've understood medicine in the natural world isn't really working anymore because there's just this disease that's wiping out so many people so quickly and it doesn't make sense. So there's also this very intensely religious aspect of it, which I'll talk a bit more about later, but, you know, the idea that this is a punishment from God. It's a punishment for our collective sinfulness. So we have to atone for being so sinful also really comes into it. Um, so that's sort of how they're understanding the plague as sort of a combination of all of our humors are out of balance, probably because of miasma, which is like the idea of like kind of rancid air, which is throwing off everyone's humors and we have to try and balance that. But it's also being caused by the wrath of God. So thinking about this, like what I sort of hooked onto, I mean, one is the, the punishment from God, which especially makes sense because people are dying so quickly, but the the cleaning and the bathing and the, the soups and teas and tisanes and things like that, for a bacterial infection, when you don't have antibiotics, I mean, like, being clean and keeping warm and hydrated is actually the best thing that you can do. So it's not like they were doing, you know, a whole lot of terrible things for people. Um, no, it's... You know, for the for the most part, they were doing things that, you know, we'd think of as pretty reasonable right now. Like, like when you look at a lot of these old medical texts, you know, it'll say things like, take a chicken, boil it down in, in water, and then give the broth to the sick person. It's like, oh, you're giving them chicken soup. Like, yeah. Which is just really hydrating and good, you know, it has a lot of salt and a lot of liquid and vitamins, minerals. Exactly, and it's very much this... I, I mean, to be clear, there definitely were some more desperate attempts once you start getting the plague and people start just saying, well, I'll try anything. Just, you know... Go yeah. to town. Let you know. Let's let's try more bloodletting. Let's try more leeches. Let's you know do some sort of you know maybe assorted like we'll just take all these really strange ingredients, mush them up, and eat them. Maybe if I have certain powders of certain gemstones, I can ingest that, and it's going to heal me. Like you really only start seeing the like really strange remedies from these situations where people are just out of desperation trying anything. And, I mean, I think we're seeing yeah. that now, too, with people ingesting all kinds of things that really aren't going to help. But, you know, it's just at that situation where you feel so desperate to be able to protect yourself or to make yourself better again that, you know, you start trying these quote-unquote remedies that, you know, are a bit outlandish. Yeah. And so, I mean, we know now that the best thing for communicable diseases is to distance yourself from the rest of the population, for the whole population to distance itself from each other, right? Flatten the curve, social distancing, all of these things that have been, like, queued up in our lives, just repeated over and over again. What... We've, we've been talking about how individuals responded with these particular remedies, but how did the communities respond? You know, we built this whole context up with the communities and the kingdoms and how that all operated. How, on that level, was Europe responding to this? Essentially, a lot of places were putting in a lot of similar responses to what we're seeing today, actually. So uh, the big one would be quarantine orders. For example, you know, the most famous one would be in Venice, where it's where quarantine, the word, comes from. It's this idea of a 40-day waiting period, where ships had to wait 14 days before they'd be allowed to come into Venice to make sure that no one on board had the plague. We 
And there are also, you know, this was copied by a lot of other uh, cities around the Mediterranean with forcing people to self, you know, forcing ships to isolate before they would let them into the city, which, you know, shows a very, you know, a, a, a solid understanding of this idea of an incubation time of, yes, even though these sailors might look perfectly healthy right now, we're going to make them wait it out for 40 days. Like, we want to make sure that no one is, you know, has caught it, but just isn't symptomatic yet. And you also do see these essentially kind of stay at home orders. Um, like Milan, you would have people were quarantined in their home if they were sick. Right. So, you know, that's the quarantine house. So you can't go in there. You can't, you know, leave that house or go in and out. And often those who were wealthier and had the means to escape a city and go to the countryside where it's less densely populated, less ability for the disease to spread. Like there was that understanding that more people and movement of people was also spreading this disease. So there was the idea that, you know, maybe it's miasma that's like coming off their body out of their pores or like maybe it's in their breath, they're spreading it somehow. Um, so you do have these wealthier people who just kind of, you know, they, they hit the road and go to their, to their house in the countryside and wait it out, essentially. Right. And it's like the miasma that you're waiting to clear with the house and the ships and stuff. Exactly. You're waiting to see if there's, if there's bad air on the ship, you want to give it time to like get out yes while it's still out to sea yes and it's so that nobody gets sick that like if because maybe the miasma has like gone inside the sailors but they're just not showing it right because it takes a while for the miasma to corrupt your humors um Uh, there we go right okay um and then the other thing is they understood that you know the dead bodies could also be dangerous because that could also be, you know, putrefied. It could also be releasing these miasmas. So a lot of cities had specific plague workers who they ended up hiring. And these were typically, you know, the people who were the poorest in the social ladder. You know, they wouldn't have been the the skilled tradesmen. They wouldn't have been, you know, people with money. They would have typically been, you know, laborers and people who didn't have as much to their name where they could you know, hire them because they were basically desperate enough that they were willing to do this work of burying the dead, of moving the bodies, of doing, you know, of cleaning up after after the corpses, essentially. Um, so that's another thing, is having sort of essential workers <laughs> that Yeah, I was they just going to say essential workers, stocking the grocery stores and yep. taking up trash, which... Shout out to all of our sanitation workers in every city in the entire world picking up all of the crop that we throw out all of the time. Yeah. Always and forever have been my heroes. I was obsessed with the garbage men when I was a child. Honestly, we should all be much more obsessed with it because I I have to They're say, if we the greatest. If we didn't have garbage <laughs> pickup for one week, we would fall into absolute chaos. Oh my gosh. I recently moved and my house is full of empty boxes now because we just unpacked my partner's closet. And so now we have all of his boxes. And if they told me that the recycling people were not coming on Wednesday, I would lose my mind. I just, it's such an essential job. And I feel like people are always like, you don't want to end up as a garbage man. I'm like, no, they should be paid all of the money and have everything. They're the best. (laughs) Um, Anyway. Maybe I mean, not. the plague workers. Yeah. That's just in general service workers, if we're oh, being yeah. honest. I mean, all service workers deserve higher pay and reliable schedules and, uh, you know, just like being treated like a human. But that's that's something that ain't changed, Devin. <laughs> not since the 14th century. Oh, gosh, that's so rough. I, I hate looking back and like seeing these things. It's like, why haven't we fixed this by now? Like we should be we should know what we desperately need to make 
our communities run and we should be respecting that and holding it, you know, teachers, garbage pickup, doctors, nurses, snowplow guys, especially up here in the cold and frozen north. Like, we should, they sh- they're they all essential and they should all be treated that way. I just, I don't, I'm constantly baffled by these, like, <sighs> weird societal hierarchies where people who don't make anything or contribute in a concrete way are, like, given billions of dollars. <laughs> anyway, that was my yeah. that was my little, like, hey, this <laughs> pandemic, and <gasps> clearly all plagues, uh, really point out who is necessary, like, what, what occupations, what work is necessary, not who is necessary, everyone is necessary, but, like, what occupations yes. are necessary in a society and what are not. Speaking of garbage collection, <laughs> also, can I just say... There were also extra hygienic measures put in place in a lot of oh, these cities. Really? Um, for example, London. Yeah, the king himself ordered that London that the streets be thoroughly cleaned. No, oh. so that's you know just shout out to anyone who's doing sanitation work. You've been not respected enough since at least <laughs> thirteen, at least the fourteenth century. <laughs> And I think it's time to change that because, honestly, the real MVPs. And the other big, big kind of societal things that were done to prevent the spread of the plague was limiting travel and trade. (laughs) Wow. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of cities would individually, especially um, put in these orders of saying, okay, if you you're manufacturing or producing things in the city, specifically, you know, a lot of food goods. So if you had butchering and that sort of thing going on within the city walls, it would be, well, you can't export that. You need to sell it within the city because we need that to feed our own population because we don't know what's coming in from the countryside, right? Like we don't want things moving back and forth so much. So, you know, you see all these restrictions on like what is allowed to be brought into the city, how are merchants allowed to enter? Because there was, again, this fear that, you know, even even in cloth, that in the folds of the cloth, there could be lingering miasma, and then the merchant would bring the cloth into the city, and then the plague would spread from the unfolding of that cloth. Wow. So you're very much getting these these same kinds of restrictions on trade and on travel, on nope, you can't enter our city, or maybe you can enter the city, but only after you've, you know, quarantined for X number of days somewhere outside the city so that we know that you're not, you know, you're not a carrier of this miasma, of this disease. This sounds so familiar, especially here in North America, where there is a a, a ongoing border disputes (laughs) and trade disputes the some of the trade disputes obviously started earlier than the pandemic but are being definitely exacerbated by the pandemic and you know divided families on either sides of these national borders in north america um that's just i mean this is so incredibly familiar your whole list here of what people were doing in the middle ages and did it did it help um it actually does seem to have helped in some in in some cases i mean in uh, specifically you you have milan which was very good about quarantining people uh, up but up to and including the point where uh, allegedly if you got sick with the plague they would just brick up the doors and windows of your entire house and you and everyone <laughs> wow, in that, that household is... would just be left there so you know, taking it a little extreme, but they managed to suppress the plague. They really, really flattened that curve. Well, it can, but, damn. I mean, Oops. But yeah, at what wow, cost? At what cost? Specifically, because what they really need to be breaking up is the rats inside the house, right? So that would be the difference in like how effective the quarantine there would be yes. versus now in this explicitly human illness that is like a, a respiratory virus that we're spreading. You know through our faces 
Yes. And the other big thing is, I mean, it probably did to a certain extent stop stop it spreading as widely as it could have. Um, but I mean, ag- again, we're talking about something that's spread right. on fleas, on rats in pre-modern cities. There's really not a lot that could be done um, beyond... But the stopping the trade and stopping like mass yes. human movement would stop the mass movement of these Yes, rats. exactly. And... And quarantining the ships, I mean, you're keeping keeping them there long enough for rats theoretically to die, the fleas to die. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where it's kind of a question of how much were they able to do. I mean, there were definitely things they were doing that did help, right? But it, it also was effectively something that... They they had much, much less control over this than we do over COVID-19. And I think that's, you know, that that is something for us to take heart in, that we we are able to do quite a bit more about it than people in the past were. You yeah. know, if, if yeah. we choose to well, do more so, about it, that is. Yeah, if we collectively choose to do this. And so, like, speaking about that, you know, how we respond, I mean, particularly the the mental health and existential crisis that is coming from our current plague, like we talked about before, earlier in this podcast, that, you know, this was a hugely traumatic event on top of a famine and cattle plague and all of these, you know, other things that were happening. So it's just like trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma for, you know, a couple of generations. How did people then respond to that, you know, culturally, spiritually, emotionally? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> let's let's get the really the really horrible ones out of the way. Um, a big part of it, uh, a big part of that response was um, violence and xenophobia towards Jewish communities, uh, towards foreigners, towards beggars, lepers just again sort of blaming the people at the margins of society and taking out this kind of anger and trauma and instead you know saying well it must be the lepers who are spreading this disease because they are themselves diseased so we should we we have to you know kill them or you know this right. is where you also see a lot of this um persecution of Jewish communities of saying, well, they're the ones causing the plague, so we need to eliminate them from our communities. And it's this really, it, you know, it's, it's again, it's something that's difficult because on one hand you're getting, to an extent, these positive community responses, but these community responses can also become very violent and exclusionary and cruel. And I think it's, you know, it it is unfortunately one of the ways that people have responded to these kinds of events. Yeah, like across time, the the moving closer together as an immediate community often leads to exclusion of people on the edges of that community and or outside who are trying to come into the community. Yes, and it creates this very us like versus tragic. them mentality and a very yeah. um, uh, a fear of the other and this, this feeling that you have to draw these lines of who's the in-group and who's the out-group and um, how, that, how that plays out. Yeah, as opposed to a larger mutual aid that can invite people in exactly it. and i mean as we've in like spoken place, about obviously. before in this podcast there you know there there also was this sort of community to to an extent a sort of coming together in certain ways so it it really does vary based on based on place based on the contexts and uh and so then how 
I know there are other other periods closer to what I've studied um, of sort of mass death that radically changed the way that Christians view all God, death, the process of dying, a lot of these things. How did this play out in the Middle Ages within the scope of religiosity? Well, in the Middle Ages, you end up kind of seeing both a sort of religious zeal take certain people. And I mean, obviously, the most sort of enduring uh, imagery of that is the flagellant brothers, right? The monks who would walk through towns Mm -hmm. whipping themselves as atonement for their sins and for the sins of mankind in general, because, you know, as they saw it, this was a horrible punishment from God, and they had to make up for it in some way. And on the other extreme, you do start seeing a certain element of hedonism, a kind of rejection of the, not necessarily of religion, but certainly a rejection of the organized religion and a a rejection of the church, especially in communities where, you know, maybe your local priest had fled at the beginning of the plague and didn't stick around to do last rites. You know, you're going to be quite angry about that and maybe just say, well, who cares? I'm going to do whatever, you know, like, we... Yeah, loss of faith in the institution. Exactly, and there's a lot of loss of faith in the institution, but again, on the other hand, you have people who, I mean, we're also looking at this as, oh my god, the end times are coming. Like, this is the apocalypse. And, you know, you end up with, again, this real, um, this real turning to the institutions, because again, this is in the Middle Ages, the, the church is running most, you know, most forms of like hospice care, of elder care, of hospitals, of orphanages. So you're, you know, you're depending on, how you've experienced this, you might end up, you know, really latching onto this, but you might also end up really mm-hmm. turning away from it. So it's a very individual experience in in that sense. Right. Um, mostly based on, um, I, I would say the the strength of um, the strength of these religious institutions in your community, because you know, yeah, if you're living in the community where your priest says, I'm out of here, and runs off, yeah, you're more likely to say, well, you know, I'm, I uh, complete, like, well, that's, that's useless, so we'll figure out something else, versus, you know, someone who's maybe living in an area where they're getting more support from these institutions. Something you said earlier, just, I mean, we've talked about it before, but always really strikes me when, if, if you're listening to this and seeking some sort of comfort from the past, uh, we talked about this <laughs> a lot earlier in the spring, that the the number of times that people have thought that the world is ending and or the world was on the brink of ending and or, you know, we were close to just utter and complete societal collapse and all of these things that are happening. Uh, the number of times that that has happened before, right? Oh, always makes me take comfort when I start to feel like the world is ending. I'm like, ah, but, you know, people, humanity as, like, a larger force made it through that. So we can do this. <laughs> yes, and it's it's very much this, it it can feel like the the end of the world, but it's it's maybe just the end of your way of of doing things like we know that things yeah. can't go back to you know quote unquote normal post covid yeah. but that doesn't mean that there's not a world to return to or that life is no longer worth living or that you know there will never be meaning again because that's not true and there's there we've seen in the past that people have been able to navigate these types of crises and you know, come out the other side and things have changed, but all life is changed, so <laughs> nothing yeah. is static. Well, and that, <laughs> that leads us, like, really well into 
I mean, so coming out of the Black Death, as after you have, you know, what is it? Is it a third? Uh, depending on the area, there's been estimates of anywhere from a third of the population to, you know, up to, I've seen, 60%. So... Oh, so one to two thirds <laughs> of people lost from yes <laughs> uh, typically more uh, how how does that affect mm. how how does that affect you know the the way of life the the process of existing in europe and in society after that then? i mean first things first immediately after the plague and you know it, it has these subsequent subsequent recurrences i think sort of intellectually and Artistically, there's this big shift towards um, what's called the dance of death, right? So it's using a lot of skeletons and skulls and decaying flesh and this sort of imagery around death and dying. And I think that really becomes um, this focal point is that in a lot of culture, there's this new shift towards this sort of constant thinking about death and remember your own mortality, you know, memento mori. And so I, I think that is a big shift to go to, to go towards, towards this much more melancholy view of, of life and death and, and this sort of fixation on death. And, and of course you, you do have this trauma that comes out of it and this very, you know, the, the difficulties of socially and emotionally coming back after that, um, in terms of sort of the material standards of living, it... it, it Just a, a question real quick, because we're talking about coming back. How long was this, pro the plague process? Like, how long were people dying like this um, of the plague? It peaked in Europe from... 1347 is technically when it started, um, like late 1347, and then it sort of petered out around 1351. So this is a, ah, a yeah, I, I should have made that more clear, is that this is a many-yeared process. <laughs> Like this is four yeah, so years everybody who's upset about death spending time inside for four or five months. <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> yeah. We've got years, people. <laughs> um Okay. So yeah, that's a that's a lot. And to lose like half of your population in four years is astounding. Yeah, and it it really creates a lot of a lot of vacuums. You have orphaned children, you have you know, elderly people who suddenly don't have any younger relatives because, I mean, this was quite indiscriminate about who it killed, right? It wasn't, you know, it killed children to elderly essentially at the yeah. same rate. Like, there doesn't seem to really be much difference. Um, and, you, you know, just a lot of these old social structures just weren't, were, were having a hard time kind of staggering along when you've lost so much of the population so the other big thing is you actually see a phenomenon um, of medieval abandoned villages because you'll you'll have had all these situations where in many cases so many people in the village had died off that it just wasn't a viable community anymore so the handful of people left would go and you know maybe move to be with relatives in another place or to be with friends or they would go to the city to find work because a lot of these communities just fully collapsed. Um, and, and during the process of this, it also means losing a lot of, a lot of farmland um, because, you know, you don't have people, it, it takes work to keep land arable, right? Like you need to be plowing it. You have to, get the weeds out, you don't want trees to start growing and bushes to start growing. So as these villages collapse, those people are gone. And even the villages that are remaining, you have such a shortage of labor that a lot of the land that could have been put under cultivation just isn't able to be to be farmed anymore. Right. And the so and and I'm assuming then also so you're losing arable land. 
and like workers and also when we talked about before with the priests and stuff all of that technology that we had talked about in reading writing and education systems in these like institutions i'm assuming those also falter there's definitely some faltering i would say the church still comes out relatively all right um only because by this stage they are such such a large and spread out and powerful institution and you you end up having this institutional memory because even if only a handful of monks from any particular monastery made it right or a handful of nuns maybe mm-hmm. survived they have the advantage of having libraries of having written things down and these are yeah. literate people and they're mm-hmm. able to you know recruit more people to come join um there's also again the issue of there's a lot of orphaned children who would have ended up you know just by default kind of ending up in a monastery or a convent kind of situation so the the church as an institution i would say is able to bounce back relatively quickly only because of that institutional memory and and be and is that easier in in some parts of Europe than in others? Um, I'm not. Or is the church pretty secure all around? At this stage, the church is still quite secure all around. Um, it's really although during the Protestant Reformation, you actually do see, um, you do see reformers making the argument that you know the church. If, if it really was the true, the one true faith, the one true church, that they should have been able to, you know, foresee that the plague was coming and do something to stop it, or they should have been able to, you know, pray and stop the plague. And, you know, it, uh, so, you know, in, in the short term, the Catholic Church doesn't, isn't overly harmed by the plague, mostly because, uh, again, you have the institutional memory. It's also that a yeah. lot of uh, monasteries and convents are, by design, located in the middle of nowhere, so you're less likely to get yeah. plague in the first place. Um, but, you know, you could say in the long run, this was damaging. Yeah, as, like, the the cultural trauma in part leads to The reformations. Yeah, I think that's, there's definitely an argument to be made there that, you know, the church's inability in the 14th century to, you know, stop the plague or to stop the famines definitely did create these sort of fissures. You know, it, it questioned, it yeah. brought into question the legitimacy of the church yeah. in the long Obviously, run. Obviously, the reformations are a massive whole other oh, thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, we could do... And have a yeah. lot of... <laughs> a lot of stuff. <laughs> of things that lead to the Reformations. But uh, this would be one of those many things. Um, and so then... So if you're not uh, in a monastery or a convent, um, if you're just, like, regular Joe peasant, uh, what... How does... How does your life change coming out of this? Um, your relationship with your lord or knight or king? I mean... Uh, what does? How does this pyramid start to shift or change? It... And or the responsibilities within Sid? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it really ends up coming down to where you live and how able you are as a peasant community to advocate for your rights in a lot of ways. So if you look at, say, Bohemia and much of Eastern Europe, the time after the Black Death is actually when you start seeing a lot less freedom for peasants and when you really start seeing um, serfdom really uh, take hold in that whole region. And I mean, it essentially, in many places stays that way you know, for centuries afterwards, um, because you have so many of 
you know, the, the aristocracy looking around and seeing, well, okay, about half of my workforce is suddenly gone. Uh, I'm going to make it very, very difficult for the other half to leave. <laughs> like, you all yeah. belong to me and this land now, and you are not allowed to go away ever. <laughs> right. Um, but then you look at other places, like, say, within especially Western Europe, um, you know, there's there's a case to be made that, you know, for, for a while at least after the Black Death, like in the short run, the peasants actually were able to kind of negotiate these rights and negotiate for higher wages. And it it really does just kind of you know, I'm obviously painting with a broad brush here, but this I'm just talking about sort of the big um, trends we see that, you know, in Eastern Europe, by and large, you did have more serfdom. And in Western Europe, you ended up with peasant communities that were able to demand, you know, maybe better land, uh, higher wages, less time um, in labor obligations to the Lord and more time that they could spend, you know, working their own vegetable garden or working their own plot of land or whatever else. And uh, particularly in England, we see that peasants are relatively well off for quite a time there because they're able to bargain for these better wages, or if they go to the cities, they're able to, you know, maybe negotiate an apprenticeship for a better price than they would have had beforehand when it was a much more crowded market. However, big however, but. big but, big but, I, I, uh, I want to make it clear that, you know, you're still dealing with, e even with the higher wages and a higher, um, semi better standards of living. I mean, you've essentially you're in a Thanos snap situation like half your population is gone essentially overnight like it's still not a like oh great my wages went up situation like you're still it's still quite precarious for everyone yeah. because you know you never know when another wave of plague is going to come by you've lost so many people so many villages you're maybe not producing as much food as you used to but yeah so for for a time there in england it's not a it's not half bad um, and i'm going to i'm going to latch on to that part of what you're saying here you keep saying for a time yes uh after this time of it not being absolutely terrible uh what happens in this like northern northwestern part of europe yeah i mean it's uh, essentially it's it's not absolutely terrible in that the people who remain are able to, you know, have a bit more leverage. They're able to say, well, there's very few people who are left to do work, which means mm -hmm. that if you want me to work, I expect better wages. Yeah. However. <laughs> however. There's, there's, there's always, always a, a however. <laughs> this creates a situation where... The gentry, the aristocracy, you know, sort of the, the people who are in charge of things start looking and say, well, Eastern Europe is producing a lot of wheat, and they are willing to export that wheat to us. Why mm -hmm. should we keep producing wheat when it's more expensive to have our peasants make wheat, or grow wheat, not make it, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh... When it would, in fact, be cheaper for us to import the wheat that we need. And then they realize, oh, I can enclose all my lands, kick everyone off, hire back, like, three shepherds, and then just keep sheep as a cash crop. Uh, and just export wool in yes. trade for yes. wheat and or for coin it, exactly because wool is a you know it's a valuable commodity and you uh, i mean especially in on on the british isles it's 
prime sheep country. It's quite, you know, relatively yeah. rainy, lots of grass growing. It's it's not that hard to keep a sheep alive there and you can get really good quality wool out of them. And this is, you know, as we've spoken about on the private property episode, this is what really creates this permanent uh, landless working class in, in England where you have people who've been forced off their land, off their homes. And this process already starts in the late 14th century, but it's really picking up speed by the 15th and 16th centuries. Wow. Cool. So things don't, like, get better. People don't sit, come from this tragic event and say, like, oh, we must work together to build a better future. It's no. No, your, your <laughs> options are become an actual literal serf or get chased off of your land by your horrible landlord who doesn't care about you dying in the streets. Ooh, excellent. So, like, as we look back on this time, uh, purely from, like, a historian, historical, like, lens, what what do we take away from this? I mean, my big ones would be don't okay let me restart that no i'm going for your conclusion because okay just like, yeah yeah for just as well, history yeah i think the big the big th takeaways would be overpopulation is a myth this idea that you know famine is caused because there's too many people living there or you know we can't provide for everyone because there's too many people is just completely ridiculous. You had a higher population in, you know, the year 1300 than in many cases, like pre-plague levels did not resume. Like you did not get that same number of people as they had in 1300 until the 19th century in a lot of places. It took that long to recover. So there was never an overpopulation problem in Europe. The problem was enclosure and forcing people off of the land that for centuries had supported them no problem, essentially. And as we've seen in the management of the famine and in the management of the cattle plague, that a, a lot of it also really comes down to how you respond to it. Because if more emphasis had been put on the well-being of the community rather than the enrichment of the wealthy um, in, you know, focusing more on sowing good nourishing crops and getting more oxen and more cattle rather than buying up sheep as a cash crop, a, a lot of good could have been done. And arguably, some of the some of the effects of the Black Death could have even been mitigated because you would have had a population that was stronger and more able to withstand uh, a novel disease. And yeah. I think another big thing, just to <laughs> just to also say, is this this whole myth of the tragedy of the commons is also just ridiculous because you look at the Middle Ages and. You have people farming land in common, and they're coming up with these new ideas. They're using, you know, they're innovating what type of plows they can use. They're innovating how to grow different foods more effectively and more more efficiently. And you're getting these better seed yields and better yields of crops in general. And it is very, um, very concerning that you know we still keep falling for these these old myths of oh well people can't farm land together people can't do things in common because then they won't be motivated to innovate <laughs> yeah when time and time again the prospect of social exclusion is the most uh like motivating for people to participate and be in community with each other uh, much more so than capital could 
Um, Absolutely. And I, I think as one last thing is just, I think, circling back to the the Black Death specifically is, you know, this idea of as as much as as much comfort as this is able to offer, just being able to look back on this type of event and say, all right, people thought that the world was literally ending. You know, it's this horrible, traumatic event, but there are ways through it, and you can choose to find more positive ways to to make your way through these kinds of situations and to try to find ways to better your communities and to come out better for it. Yeah, and I think, you know, what I think is the most important part of of practicing history and historical inquiry is looking at, you know, how did people respond to this and how did it create the world that we live in now? Um, And we're looking at it and seeing, you know, this rise of of like sort of wealth hoarding and what becomes modern capitalism coming out of this uh and seeing that it 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 really did as much harm as it possibly could and very little good uh we can look at that and see well obviously we're not in the exact same situation but we're in a similar situation where the global society is, has shut down and we have a chance to to build a new society as we come out of it, what what do we want to do? And I think the importance of, of looking at this and seeing how so much created more harm here, you know, the, the response to famine and plague created a weaker population that then was more susceptible to, you know, a human disease, uh, if we going forward look at COVID or whatever we decide to rename it <laughs> to make people more afraid, uh, you know, we can realize the the thing that's really going to help is is mutual aid, is looking to our community as a source of support for everyone. That if everyone is doing better, if everyone is healthy, if everyone has food and shelter and a place to be safe and a place to social distance if they need to, but a place to be healthy, then we're all healthier. Um, And I think that's really the moral of... If if we're going to moralize history, um, that it is is mutual aid. I I really like that because it it, it also ties into this idea of I mean, bring it, bringing it back to my my medieval <laughs> medieval medical history, you know, there there was this idea at the time of, you know, there was no division between public health and individual health, like yeah, even before the plague, there was this idea of you know we need to make sure that we have hospitals for sick people to go to, and we need to make sure that. You know, there's some level of 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 habitability in our cities. You know, there there were these ways of trying to make things at least not to our standards of hygiene necessarily, but you know, things like having zoning laws so that the butcher wasn't like right beside you weaving fabric and like trying to you know, have public latrines and public amenities to help keep things somewhat cleaner. And, you know, these the, these ideas that I think we could really stand to go back to that and towards the idea that, you know, health is not an individual endeavor. It's something that requires a community and a community structure to thrive in. Yeah. And I think there are people, I mean, that's, again, undoing Victorian ideas of realizing that a lot of disease is has its roots in social practice, that 
people who don't have the means to get by, that don't have the means to have healthy food, that don't have the means to have a healthy living situation, are going to get sick and be chronically ill, you know, more often than not. And that if a lot of our population is in that situation, when something like a novel virus comes along, we're all going to be in a worse situation you know, in in confronting a, a new source of illness. Um, and that the people who are already in these more dire situations are going to be more affected by the, the a new virus and that this is just going to keep happening, you know, onward into eternity. Um, I think going back to that idea of, of all health is personal health all health is public health you know yeah i it's a healthier society a healthier society creates a healthier individual and if we have to make sure that everybody thinks about community aid and community and mutual aid as a way to personally benefit then you know i'm fine if the outcome is that more people are willing to participate (laughs) in mutual aid (laughs) and i think on that note i i do just want to end this podcast by encouraging anyone obviously these are really tough times but if you have the means to you know support your local mutual aid funds food banks soup kitchens there are a lot of people who are really really suffering and really struggling during this pandemic and i i think we can all work together and and try to try to make it a little bit less bad yeah. I, we we can't none of us can fix it by ourselves and of of course that's not on any one individual but i think you know if we're at all able to help those who have been harmed by our systems then i think that's at least something that we can do something we can control in this time of just uncontrollable yeah events we can start we can start building the foundations of the institutions that will keep us safe and healthy in the future. If we start investing in mutual aid and in social aid now, um, and that can come in terms of like, literally, if you have financial means, donating to organizations, to non-governmental entities, but also to uh, voting and advocacy, um, for changing on like a larger systemic level as well. Um. And I guess we'll say goodbye for now. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We'll get all our updates and we'll be back next week.